Hello there, I'm Jamie Grace. I'm currently a senior lecturer in law in the Department of Law and Criminology at Sheffield Hallam University. And I've worked at Hallam since January 2014. I've been a course leader there. Um, I look after, at the moment, um, the MA and LLM in Applied Human Rights as courses in my department. And I've been doing that for about four years. Um, I, I was also a, a course leader of an undergraduate law degree too. I don't have much uh, experience in PhD supervision. I've just um, one or two PhD um, students that I've been working with in the last couple of years or so. Um, I am an active researcher myself, of course, as a law academic. I research in the Helena Kennedy Centre for International Justice at Sheffield Hallam. Um, in terms of my own wider networks, I, I've been appointed as vice chair for an independent data analytics ethics committee established by the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner and I'll hold a visiting fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies this summer in 2020 as part of the Centre for Information Law and Policy at IELTS. I'm the Research Impact Lead for Social Policy um, for the REF uh, at Sheffield Hallam, that, that's Unit of Assessment 20 in REF 2021 terms. Um, I've actually adapted this screencast from my usual advice on developing research impact. Um, I've tried to make it more relevant to the connected issue of building an academic and professional network rather than research impact per se, um, but there are real links there. I think to be an impactful researcher, to, to shape policy, and certainly as a law academic trying to do that, you have to be a good networker, you have to be well connected. So academics are normally dual role to an extent by which I mean there's normally a kind of institutional, inward-looking, very, very um, individual role that we have where we think about our own research as an end in itself. And then we're normally pushed as well or pulled towards another role, the, the networked academic, the idea of being someone who is um, available to policymakers, who collaborates with other researchers who gets out of their own institution and goes to conferences and things and and you know things like conference attendance are really the start of building your own network and it, and it is crucial to network with other academics um through things like conferences and stuff um but most of us probably move along a scale of armchair philosopher to field philosopher to use a, a phrasing developed by Diana Hicks and Jay Britt Holbrook in a blog post they wrote for the LSE Impact blog um, recently, it's well worth a read, uh, would be my recommendation. And, and most of us are somewhere on that scale of armchair to field as a researcher in the context of our own legal discipline or sub-discipline. And we'll change, you know, when, when you're doing uh, very dense periods of research, perhaps you're finishing your PhD thesis, you'll be focused purely on your own research. You won't be open as much to networking opportunities. You won't have the time available. But then there'll come a time when you're desperate for people to use your research and you'll want to switch to the field philosopher role um, from the armchair philosopher role. So um, I, I would like you to try three exercises um, around defining, planning and recording your network building. I'll, I'll explain these three uh, exercises um, one by one uh, just now. So it's it's important in the first of these three exercises to, to think carefully about how you define yourself and how you define what I'd term your academic arena. Not to sound too grand, this is just the idea that we all categorise our work in, in categories and subcategories. We put ourselves into a mental box uh, we say that we are human rights law academics, or we say that we're employment law academics, um, or criminal law academics. Perhaps we categorise ourselves by methodology. Um, but sometimes, if we were honest with ourselves, our work could be categorised by other people using a different perspective in a larger number of ways. So we might tend to have just a, a couple of labels to put on our work. So I, I tend to be, tell people that my research is about um, human rights and policing, or um, criminal records, or administrative law. You know, I, I tend to keep things quite brief. Um, but, but if I'm honest, you know, my policing research actually um, touches on areas of regulatory theory, public policy, um, as well as human rights law, um, privacy law, prevention of domestic violence, 
and th and things like that. So um, first of all, our first exercise, come up with a category of work, uh, a, a category uh, system for your work, a, a long list, if you like, of all the different perspectives that people might um, see your work as. Then think about planning your profile. So the, the second exercise is, is probably the most uh, graphical, the most, uh, most uh, visual of the three. Um, you need to make a map. You need to draw a diagram. I would recommend doing this as a paper exercise to actually draw a diagram or a map on a piece of paper. Uh, make it a very tactile thing to begin with. You might want to type this up. You might want to make a kind of um, electronic version to keep and share more easily. But basically, you want to make a map, I think, of your key stakeholders. They're the, they're the people who, who have an interest in your research process. Um, and think broadly. So all the people in your institution who might help you with your research, all the different bits of your own university where you work or study, um, the organisations that you've done research with or for. Then think about all the policy makers and all the people with influence who might use your research. And then think of all the people that you can who are end users or beneficiaries of research who would benefit from the knowledge that you're developing, gathering and creating in your own research. So make that, make that map before we move on to our third exercise. So thirdly, you need to record and document your networking successes and you need to find a method that works for you. And you need to actually take some time to do this because when you're preparing for job interviews, when you're preparing research grant proposals or funding bids, and when you're starting to network with people in a more planned way, um, you'll want to be able to have a portfolio of contacts um, to draw on, to ha have a reference from, have a testimonial from, to um, peer review your work informally before you send it off to uh, journals for a true uh, blind peer review process. And so it's important to actually have a effectively a historical record, like a, like a date, uh, date stamped record of all of the networking successes you've made, you know, you've had the, the contacts you've made, the benefit they brought to your research or the opportunity that they shared with you. And you need to keep track of these uh, in a way that, that can kind of live on. You might want to use um, a Google Doc, for example, something that's um, based in the cloud that you can effectively take with you from one institution to another, something on Dropbox, perhaps, something like that. To read what's timely and, and, and of the moment can we manufacture that uh, or indeed should we not manufacture that now then this is taking the idea of the field philosopher uh, that was mentioned a little bit earlier on to a logical extent so if we purposefully set out to undertake research projects about pressing problems contemporary issues and um, that policymakers are currently concerned with uh, in practice areas as well or professionals are bothered by interested in pressured to meet if we can manufacture research in those areas by planning to do research that is timely then we will in turn have more impact and as a result our network will grow commensurately you might be interested in doing a bit of follow-up reading uh, on, on the, the, the work this paper by Lawrence McNamara um, uh, on understanding research impact in law that he published in the King's Law Journal in 2018 um, where he asks um, effectively influential law researchers um, from the 2014 Research Excellence Framework Outcomes um, why they felt they were influential, why they felt they had impact in effect with, with people like policymakers, um, and the timeliness of research was was the, the number one thing for the the law academics that Lawrence McNamara surveyed in, in that regard. You know, timeliness of research was the thing that people accepted to a greater extent than any other factor was the reason why people listened to them, and and that really means that that's a good way of building a network. Therefore, if people are listening to you people are using your research, then your research is, is, by having that influence, is building your network for you too. So there are some sort of pre-planned, very strategic ways of raising your profile. And, and I would, thought I would list a few of these, sort of, I've described them, I would describe them as set piece methods um, of, of raising your profile and building a network. And this is effectively different styles of academic 
um, self-promotion really, but um, turning your research writing, your book chapters, your articles, your thesis chapters, turning them into a report on a public policy issue where relevant. So making sure that your recommendations and a summary of your findings, you know, are easily accessible in a short, you know, two or three page document rather than a 10,000 word journal article. It's more shareable. It's more clickable. People will read it and they'll read it quickly. Um, but they'll understand and you will explain in your two or three page short report or summary of your research. That there is a big body of work that underpins this that can be read elsewhere. Um, but policymakers will, will want to, um, become part of your network they'll, they'll want to draw on you and let you into their networks if, if they feel you have research of value for them and well how will they know that unless they read your um your journal articles you might think well if they never read your journal articles because they're too long then you need to think about the format in which you're communicating your research um in order to kind of work your way into people's networks uh, particularly in in public bodies for example uh, and in government by complete contrast, think about open educational resources or OERs. OERs uh, effectively uh, trying to have influence with and build network networks with other educators. So these are educational materials that you put on platforms like YouTube, you know, video lectures, videos of seminars, screencasts, podcasts, things like that. Um, the idea being that when people use your materials because they're freely available for them to use, they might want to follow up and get in touch with you. Um, it will help to build your profile as a teacher of what you also research. But the people that are teaching the same things as you are also likely, therefore, to be researchers doing the same research as you. And so they'll have a network that you want to tap into as well. OERs give you a kind of common ground for doing that. Um, uh, we obviously as law researchers are interested in things like legislative reform there are very good examples around at the moment of academics and law academics in particular putting together draft bills like draft legislation so not just arguing for legal change in a in a doctrinal black letter law journal article but also then um, to make that research output more accessible and more persuasive and interesting for policymakers to to look at and examine put a draft bill together with some kind of explanatory notes that reference the research that you've done and draw on the research that you've done. And and the draft bill starts a conversation around the legislative reform agenda that you want to start. And the people that are interested in that become part of your network um, with a bit of luck. You, you can think about yourself as well as a campaigner. You, you don't. We don't have to see ourselves as kind of static law academics. We can see ourselves as activists. This is a kind of human rights law academic in me coming out now. Um, but we can pick things to campaign on if we want. We have the credibility because we understand as law researchers what the legal reform issues might be in an area of social justice, for example. Um, why not think about campaigning content, making videos, blogs, uh, creating posters, creating infographics that could be shared on platforms like Twitter, um, writing a podcast series on a social justice issue, creating a petition to to parliament too if, if you were to do one of these things every month over the course of a year it would allow you to just give them all a try see what works for you maybe a youtube channel for for law academics in your area and law students in your area is might be the fourth or fifth of these things that you try but ultimately if you enjoy doing it and you get some instant success um then that's the one that you would keep doing. You wouldn't. I wouldn't actually recommend that you try and do all of these things all of the time. Like you would select the ones that suited the stage of your research projects and network building that you were at at that time. Um, but yeah, find a find one that works for you and, and stick with it. So um, I've got a, a bunch of time saving suggestions for profile building and, and, and network creation. Now, really, they're good academic habits for me. And their traits, I think, that a good law researcher will either purposefully adopt or end up adopting in the longer term. So the first point is to decide on your niche areas of, of uh, both research and teaching and make sure that they overlap. And I, I tend to use the phrase with colleagues that I'm sort of mentoring and things that they need to teach their niche. And when you teach that niche, it means you save a lot of time and you become more efficient. 
by having that overlap between what you research and what you teach. And you need to work out how your institution allots teaching, how your institution allows you to choose research projects and look for opportunities to blend the two together, to overlap those two areas of your work. Now, there is a big academic literature, actually, enormous, in fact, on research informed teaching, or RIT, in all disciplines. Um, and actually, a colleague of mine at Hallam, Alex Nicholson, um, has written a, a, an interesting paper for the journal, The Law Teacher, on research informed teaching, which kind of re reawakened my interest in, um, in, in that sort of pedagogic issue of trying to blend um, research into teaching and, and looking at the strengths and advantages that can be gained in, in doing that. But I think one of the big things for me is, is time efficiency in doing that, actually. Um, it certainly saves me a lot of time because needing to stay up to date with my subject area um, as a researcher means if I'm also teaching things connected to that, it's helping me make my teaching materials faster, it's helping me prepare my workshops more quickly, um, and, that, and that allows you to do more of the things on the following list so that's just the first piece of advice um but it might create more time for the next things uh, starting with starting with being multidisciplinary in the way that you set out to write your research outputs things like book chapters journal articles even blog posts first of all you need to map out your own institution you need to think about who in your faculty outside of your own department or college you know um, in related fields, who is doing research in an area that you can connect with, where you can write on things together. Writing multidisciplinary research massively increases um, uh, the type of journal that you can publish in, the type of edited book that you can publish a chapter in. Um, and, and so there's, there's a greater networking ability there. There's a, there's a much wider reach um, for a multidisciplinary piece of work. Also, um, you, you'll find that your network within your own institution is, is often overlooked. Um, sometimes we, we assume that we just need to reach out to other law researchers, but actually researchers in politics in our own, um, in my area, like human rights law, there's actually a lot of politics and history academics um, that I work with at Hallam, or I'm kind of connected with at Hallam, who informally peer review my work for example and suggest uh, improvements frankly uh, and make my work better uh, and they look at things with a fresh pair of eyes because they're not bogged down in the doctrinal detail of my work they're looking at the key message of my work because they don't they're not law academics but as history academics politics academics um, they're interested in the message and how I might refine the message of, of what I'm trying to argue or what I'm trying to say so um, the next step then is have you thought about co-publishing with academics outside your university? You'll all have an interest in promoting the research, trying to put it out into both of your sets of um, network contacts, and that will build your network very, very quickly. So that the most influential piece of research I've ever been involved with, um, and it's effectively the piece of research that's made me the research impact lead at, for my department at Hallam, was, was published with um, uh, a quantitative criminologist effectively a statistician um, at Cambridge, um, another law academic who at the time was based at Winchester University, now at Northumbria, Marion Oswald, um, and a senior police officer at Durham Constabulary. And, and we were able to talk to you know different sets of law academics, criminology academics, statisticians, and policing academics and police leaders up and down the country about our research. So because we have four authors on the study, uh, that we produced um, uh, about something that Durham, uh, a pilot scheme for uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that Durham Constabulary in the north of England were using. Um, we had we had different sets of interests. We we rapidly multiplied the network of people interested in our work. Um, another thing to think about is co-production of research with policymakers who will have far better links than you because everyone's falling over themselves to to try and have influence on policymakers and, and their networks can really benefit you if only you can tap into them so co-production is, is just the idea that effectively if you can sound out sit down with have telephone conversations with people in government people in ngos 
people in influential positions in, related to your area of research, whether they're practitioners, politicians, whoever it might be, find out from them what research it is that they think needs to be done, uh, or even legal research. Uh, this applies to that too. And, and effectively make it clear that you're interested in doing rigorous ethical research, but that you will look into things that policymakers with better links than you feel needs to be done and undertaken and then they will use your research and you can tap into the networks that they have by turn um so uh this this might seem a bit obvious but um big institutions whether it's councils central government departments um parliament itself the commons and the lords in the uk um and, and similar institutions in public sector and public life civil society in every jurisdiction in the world will, will have their own established impact avenues um, and you need to work with them. So in the United Kingdom, you need to look at things like parliamentary inquiries, calls for written evidence from government bodies, government consultations of different kinds. These, these are like a, not quite an open goal, but they are a very sensible opportunity for building your network because that's the way of, uh, that's the way of getting your research in front of policymakers with influence and with networks that you want to build on and tap into. Um, this is this for some policymakers and some government bodies is the accepted way, the, the kind of um, assumed way that you will work with them and you need to kind of use those processes. But by turn, in, in a much more kind of media savvy way, if what you're interested in doing is getting your research out to the broadest number of people biggest number of people in a possible audience you need to work in a, in a media savvy way you, you need to think about things like press releases getting on the radio um, getting a print journalists to write about your research in newspapers online and in print um, and your university will have press officers and marketing managers who are very keen to help you make content and you need to work out who these people are because um, my small experience of working with the press team and the marketing team at Hallam has been extremely positive. Um, interestingly, the Lawrence McNamara paper um, that I mentioned before uh, in this screencast, uh, the people that responded to Lawrence McNamara's survey actually, by and large, didn't think that university press officers and marketing managers were very um, useful at um, gaining traction for academic law research with policy makers it's actually one of the lowest ranked uh, features uh, or elements of why impactful law researchers with good networks feel that they have the networks and the impact that they do have and I, I don't know about that I, I think that it depends on the sort of profile you want to have the sort of network you want to build and ultimately, if you feel pressed for time and you need help writing a press release in a way that journalists can actually use, which is a massive skill, a uh, really important and difficult thing to do, make a video, script a video, this all takes time. And there are, there are professionals in your university who, who do this all, every day at work and are always looking for new content and new ways of promoting your institution let them promote you seek them out what's what's the harm you know it can only really go well for you um and and some of us will want our research to be high profile in the sense of not just influential with a small number of uh, people in whitehall or whatever you know in central government in the uk but with a global audience you know you, you might be writing about legal issues that are not uh, ones that the uk government concerns itself with but governments in um, other parts of the world might do. So you need a more global reach. So you'll need, you know, you'll need video content. You might need press releases um, that you can send out to NGOs uh, and journalists and things like this. And that type of content probably takes a lot of time and effort to craft. Um, and, and there are people very experienced at doing this at your university. But my advice would be find out who they are and sit down with them over a coffee or something and then, um, and, and find out how they like to work and what, what you could do to help them. I, I think that it would pay dividends. So good luck with building your network. Um, please do get in touch if you'd like to discuss anything in, in this presentation that I've mentioned. Um, if you'd like any advice on building your network as, a, as an academic or building toward and developing your research impact, you may well have already had some and you didn't know. 
that you did. Um, and, and it would be interesting to collaborate with any of you that have watched this if we have similar um, research interests, as always. Uh, so my email address is j.grace at shu.ac.uk. Thanks very much for listening.